In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, and that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins, for the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful, my Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. Tomorrow the church puts before us the image of Jesus as good shepherd. The gospel passage is very short. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can take them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one can take them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. My sheep hear my voice. The responsorial psalm strikes a similar note. We are his people, the sheep of his flock. My sheep hear my voice. We are his people, the sheep of his flock. And Jesus, the good shepherd. I don't know about you, but something in me resents this, right? Nothing against Jesus being a good shepherd. It's my own being a sheep that kind of rubs me the wrong way, right? Son, okay. Disciple, okay. Member of his body, okay. But a sheep, you know, it's like, well, sheep are clueless, dumb. Apparently they smell bad. Above all, like helpless, very vulnerable. And yet there it is, my sheep hear my voice. We are his people, the sheep of his flock. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep we saw last week. Our Lord's entreaty to St. Peter, feed my sheep. And okay, we might say, um, well, it's not literally, we're not literally sheep, right? We have a mind, we have a will, we have responsibilities, we have initiatives. And that's true and it's important. But nevertheless, the analogy is what is true. What a sheep is to a shepherd, I am to Christ, or you are to Christ. And what a shepherd is to a sheep, Christ is to us. And it's precisely, perhaps, Lord, the analogy that bothers me so much. (laughs) But I don't want to be so dependent on anyone. I don't want to be so vulnerable, so in need of protection. I don't want to be so led by another. To be so dependent. And this drives home, once again, we always run up against it, the transcendent value and need in our spiritual life and our faith for humility. St. Augustine calls it the abode of charity the home of charity, humility. We are his people, the sheep of his flock. Oh, what about the use of my mind? Well, it has to be living by humility. Right? With Socrates, we have to make that brilliant move to be smart enough to know that we're not that smart. Right? There are other people who are wiser and there are many blind spots that each one of us has. And compared to God, our wisdom is foolishness. So the wisest thing we can do with our own intelligence, Lord, is to have the mind of Christ, is to start depending on your teaching and your wisdom. The way and the truth and the life. To take on the mind of Christ. And what about my freedom, the use of my freedom? Well, with humility, we have to realize that the greatest use of it is to hand it over completely to God. 
the greatest accomplishment of my freedom would be to surrender it to God completely like Our Lady Fiat Mi Secundum Verbum Tuum. Be it done unto me according to your word, right? Not my own ideas, but your plan, your initiative, your word, and with my own will, which is real, I choose that. I second it. I constantly try to find his will and adapt myself to it. Like our Lord, right? I have come to do your will. When Christ came into the world, he said, I have come to do your will, O God. And what about our strength, right? We can do certain things. We can, in a certain sense, take care of ourselves. Right, what about that fear of vulnerability that we all have? Well, I think we have to realize that our own strength is very limited and many times is an illusion. Right, people worry so much about safety, security, and they take so many measures. Right, ride the bike with your with the helmet on. Yeah, but if you get hit by an eighteen wheeler, you know that helmet's not gonna right, there's always there's always accidents. We're ultimately in God's hands. My father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can take them out of the father's hand. And even things like, I don't know, there's personal self-defense. People learn jujitsu or Krav Maga. I know a girl at school who knows Krav Maga in the event. That's the uh, martial art that Jason Bourne made famous. And the whole idea is that you uh, neutralize your opponent as brutally and quickly as possible. And so I said, okay, I'm not going to mess with you. But if we think about that, right, even that super limited, right, the toughest individual fighter or self-defense expert is no match for a gang, let alone an army, even a mediocre army. And a mediocre army is no match for a well-trained army, and the best-trained army is no match for a, a famine or a plague. Right? There's no perfect security in this life based on our own wisdom, our own strength, our own resources. Vulnerability is inescapable. Right? Life is like a game of rock, paper, scissors. And no matter which one you throw, right? no matter which one you choose, someone else can always beat you. Right? <laughs> Something bad can always happen. And so we have to let go of any excessive worrying about our health or about the situation in the world, but what others can do to us. And we're in God's hands. Humility, the abode of charity. And we know, Lord, that you are charity, that, that God is love. Deus caritas est. And the Trinity, the, the doctrine of the Trinity is very deep. It shows us that humility is intrinsic to God. It's an attribute of God. The humility that leads to a total foregoing of independence, of the exaltation and the dependence on the ego, the I, separate from others. And there's no father without the son. The Father is the generation of the Son. There's no Son without the Father. There's no Holy Spirit without the Father and the Son, right? And yet, Lord, each is God. Each person is divine. And yet each is relative to the others. They're not independent. They exist in, ter in eternal relation. None is just by himself. None is God by himself. And Lord, when you become 
man, when you become a model for each one of us, this humility that exists in God becomes even more clearly revealed. St. Augustine says this, I don't have the quote here directly, but he says, you know, if you ask me what is the most important element of the doctrine of Christ, I would reply to you, in the first place, humility, in the second place, humility, in the third place, humility. And you don't have to look far in Scripture. You see, it's all over the place. Humility of mind. Humility of intellect. I have not spoken on my own, Jesus says, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment about what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I speak, therefore I speak, just as the Father has told me. And this is the eternal, this is God, right? The eternal wisdom of God speaking through Jesus Christ. I just say what the Father tells me. I'm not here to be original. His wisdom is enough for me. Humility of will. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sin offerings you take no pleasure. Then I said, see God, I have come to do your will, O God. Humility of will, humility of initiative. Our Lord says in that Gospel of John, He who sent me is ever with me. My Father has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases Him. And the humility of vulnerability, right? Christ, who is shepherd, is also sheep. The image that we bristle at of being a sheep Dumb, lead, vulnerable, food, sacrifice is the image that he embraces, that he identifies himself with. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. You're not just any sheep, Lord, but you are the lamb led to the slaughter. Right? Out of love and trust, accepting the ultimate vulnerability of this world, right? Facing the deepest fear, the fear of violent death. In an act of trust, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Nevertheless, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And so, Lord, when you say that we are your sheep, you're not doing anything that you haven't done for us. You are shepherd, but you're the shepherd, the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And he does that by becoming sacrificial lamb for his lambs. And then feeding us, not just by leading us to verdant pastures, but feeding us with, with himself. And we hold up our Lord before communion and we say, behold the Lamb of God, right? The Lamb who was sacrificed and slain. And now we communicate, participate in that sacrifice by eating the victim. And the model of the Paschal Supper of the Jews. And that radical, Lord, that radical humility, that radical vulnerability, that radical love, that radical trust becomes permanent. It's part of your glory in heaven. It's mysteriously incorporated into our Lord's glorification in heaven. Then I saw a lamb, St. John, the book of Revelation. Then I saw a lamb looking as if he had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb alive, but looking as if it had been slain. And this enters into the liturgy at Easter, one of the prefaces, talks about the lamb once slain who lives forever, the lamb once slain who lives forever. But the Latin is much more beautiful. It's the lamb who semper vivit ochisus, Semper vivit ochisus, who always lives slain, right? That that the sacrifice becomes part of his life. 
a holy and living sacrifice, we say, in, in the third Eucharistic prayer. The good shepherd, Lord, who lays down his life for his sheep, does it by becoming sacrificial lamb for his lambs. And so, Lord, help me, help me, because I bristle. I don't know why. Well, I know, yeah, we're all, <laughs> I know why. We're just, we're proud, right? And uh, we don't want to belong. We don't want to belong. We're not humble enough to belong to each other and to belong to God. To be totally dependent. To let ourselves be taken care of. And then, Lord, I wonder, why am I lonely? Well, I'm lonely because I want to be because I want to be lonely, right? And why, you know, I don't know. Why am I sad? Well, I'm lonely because I've made myself sad. Because in my pride, I, I refuse to. I refuse to to let go, to give up, to be humble, to be small, to be dependent. And how much joy, and how much peace is waiting for us on the other side of that surrender to willingly be a sheep with a shepherd, to go wherever he leads us, to eat when he wants us to eat, to do whatever he wants us to say, to hear his voice and follow him, to give up our independence, to be dependent on him, to use our freedom to freely serve him. To let go of our own ways of dealing with our fears and our vulnerabilities. How much peace on the other side of that sacrifice of a deep trust and deep humility. The Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. It images, Lord, of abundance, of security in spite of difficulty in spite of threat of peace comfort and yet the condition is there right we have to let him be we have to let him be shepherd we have to lay down our own defenses and our own initiatives and our own self-love especially Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. And St. Paul, like in so many things, St. Paul is a wonderful model of this, right? He models this so well, this total dependence on God. When I am weak, then I am strong. I glory in my infirmities. And then he talks about that peace of Christ, that love of God, which guards our hearts. In Philippians, beautiful passage. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let all men know your forbearance. The Lord is at hand. Dominus propria. God is not far. Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard, it's another translation, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. But that's an accomplishment, and it's an accomplishment of not like, okay, I need to do more, I need to assert myself more, I need to worry more. 
No, it's an accomplishment of letting go. Without me, you can do nothing. Of living, Lord, in your hand and therefore using my weaknesses and using my fears and using my vulnerabilities as great springboards to trust. Because, again, right, we have a relative strength and we have a relative intelligence and we have relative means, but they're all relative. And this is why I think, you know, people who, (laughs) I shouldn't say this, but people who are less intelligent are wiser because they don't rely on their own wisdom. And they pray more easily, perhaps. Simple people. And people who have less means find it more natural and easy to depend on God because they don't have the illusion that, oh, I've got enough money or I've got enough education or I'll have enough opportunities. But they live on God. And St. Paul says this, that if we have stuff, we have to live as if we had nothing because this is the reality of our situation spiritually. So Lord, help us to make a step or a leap or whatever we need to make to live this, to accept this, that you are the good shepherd. We are his people, the sheep of his flock. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can take them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can take them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. Lord, whatever in me that resists this, that resents it, that rejects it, help me to recognize it, and with humility and with trust in your grace, and going to Our Lady in this wonderful month of May, Help me to imitate her, right? She's this great model of humility, of dependence. The handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to your word. All generations will call me blessed because the Almighty has done great things for me. You're making herself small, making herself light. Right? She lets God lift her. To, to, to greatness. But the ego has to be, right? The ego has to be um, conquered. It's St. Augustine, right? My love is my weight. My love is my weight. Amor meus pandus meus est. That we go where, we go where our, the center of our value is. And so the more we love ourselves, well, the more we, we, we become immovable by God. He can't do much with us. The more, Lord, I insist on my own way and my, my own security with my own means and my own excellence and my own time and my own whatever, well, the more my weight is centered in myself right? and, I, and I can't be lifted up. And the more, Lord, I think about you and the more I just try to do things for love and and not worry about how I'm feeling or what's going to happen to me or how others are treating me or whatever, well, the lighter I become, right, and the the more God can, can lift me up, can magnify me and exalt me, right? He who humbles himself will be exalted. He who exalts himself will be humbled. And this is Our Lady, right? She says, no, all of my love is for God. And I realize that I'm just handmaid. I'm just servant. I'm just vessel. Emptying herself out so that God can fill her completely. And how do we do that? Well, um, 
it's hard, right? <laughs> because our self-love is so is so uh, deeply ingrained. But a shortcut is just what we think about. Just think about God, right? Sin was where our father says that at some point. He's like, you know, just think about think about Jesus and, and don't worry about yourself. Why? Because even if you're the biggest loser in the world, right? Even if you have all the sins in the world, well, Jesus is is still good and he still loves you and God is still good and he's an infinite good and he can overcome all that. And so why think about yourself even if you're bad? And think about the solution, not the problem. And think about God. Think about others. Our Lady, our Mother, the Queen of Heaven, we can say Mother of the Lamb, Mother of the Lamb of God. And pray for us. Help us to accept Jesus as our, as our shepherd and help us to accept especially this role that we all have of being sheep. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.